Hey everyone, thanks for joining in and thanks for showing up for Thorn Brothers 2021 Spring Sale. I'm Jeremy Smith with Wonder Media Productions, Angling Edge TV, Angling Buzz. And uh, the seminar that I'm gonna do is about something special to me, I'm guessing to a bunch of you as well. It's Sunset Country Muskies, Northwest Ontario. I believe the most beautiful place on the planet to fish muskies. Unfortunately, we couldn't get there last year. Hopefully, we'll be able to get up there later this summer, but I hope everyone enjoys and take advantage of the great sale here at Thorn Brothers. All right, welcome everyone and thank you for joining this. My name is Jeremy Smith from Linder's Angling Edge and I'm going to be talking about, well, one of my favorite things and that is musky fishing in Sunset Country, Ontario, Canada. So this was an unfortunate year that we weren't able to cross the border and fish that really special, amazing place. And I'm gonna share with you pretty much my experiences up there, some of the things I've seen, share with you a number of things uh, I've learned about different bodies of water up there. I've had the good fortune to uh, go up there not only for fun, but spend a lot of times up there working in, in different locations. So we've had a pretty unique experience uh, working with television to go to a number of different lodges in a number of different places up there and kind of be forced into many of them to learn what the bite is at any given point in time. So I'm going to share those experiences with you. This will be a little bit different for me. I'm used to giving seminars where uh, it's more of a discussion where we can interact with each other. So I'm going to be doing a bit of rambling here, but uh, at the end of it, I'm really looking forward to answering any questions that, uh, that you may have. So let's just get started. This is called Sunset Country Muskies. And uh, the reason I chose this topic because I do really feel that this is the best place to fish muskies. This is just my opinion. I, I think it, it is for a number of reasons. One, the scenery is spectacular. I think this is one of the most beautiful places on the, on the planet. It's, it's gorgeous. It's wilderness fishing. There's so much crown land in many places where if you're from Minnesota, Wisconsin, or the Midwest, you know that many of the fisheries we have are busy with a number of boaters. There are a lot of other anglers on the water. And so to have the opportunity to go somewhere where you're, you're seeing true wilderness and you can be by yourself and fish, it, it really makes the experience, to me, that much better. Um, also, the, the spots are, are really, really cool. Now, I know that a lot of the, the lakes in the Midwest have cool spots, but Ontario has really cool spots where you can envision, you know, the, the back end of a, a cabbage bay that's eight to 10 feet deep with cabbage plants that are this big around with a beautiful boulder point leading into it with a saddle going to an island with more weeds in between next to really deep water. So it's like everything you could ever picture a musky spot being, it has it there. And you're target casting, you get to throw to specific areas where you're like, there should be a fish sitting right here. So that, that adds to it. Just the, the spots are really fun to fish and they're complex. And uh, the fish are wild. So I'm, I'm so thankful that we've got these great stocking programs. The Madison chain is a great example of some amazing fishing that's, uh, that's come out of a stock fishery. Minnesota has a number of uh, fisheries that have, have just produced amazing fish, but not, not to take anything, anything away from stock fish, but when you go to some of these places, you know, Lax, Sewell, for example, uh, other places up there. These are wilderness fish. In some cases, these fish just don't ever encounter people. They're wild, natural fish. And to me, there's something special about hunting an animal in its native habitat where it's really not disturbed. So that's another element to me that, uh, that makes, it, makes it awesome. And then exploring. So many of these fisheries are extraordinarily vast. Many people are familiar with uh, the Lake of the Woods, over a million acres of water to explore. And it's, it's, it's just huge. It can go so many different places. Wabagoon, very similar. Lac Sewell is an absolute monster. You cannot believe how enormous Lac Sewell is. So, so many of these places you can just go explore and it's just, you, you can go wherever you, your gut tells you to go. That looks like a cool place over there. That looks cool. You look at the map and you wonder what could be around the next corner. So there's, there's these other, other elements along, besides just fishing, it's, it's seeing the scenery, it's exploring. It's, it, those are some of the, the deals that really make it cool. And it's also patterning. So, for example, where I live in central Minnesota, a lot of the lakes, even the big lakes, like Leech Lake, for example, that I grew up on, yes, there's a pattern, but I'll just use the rocks on Leech Lake for an example. Often it's just spots. So it's submarine island is hot, or Pelican Reef is hot, or Moki Reef is hot. 
yeah, that the, there can be a pattern where the fish are on the rocks, you can say, but often it's just one or two of the reefs are actually firing, <coughs> excuse me, where there's fish on those particular spots. And some of the smaller lakes, they might only have one, one point, they might only have one hump, so there's just, you can't really put a pattern together. You can, the fish are in the weeds, or the fish are on the rocks, or they're using open water, but there's a lot of places they're just smaller, so there's only a couple spots that you can really fish, where in Ontario, there are so many spots that are the same. Often there's hundreds of spots that are almost identical in makeup spread over a large area. So if you figure out that the fish are sitting in, the, in a cup of a little sandy bay on the lee side of an island, you can go, oh, I know one, two, three, four, five, six of them that are within five miles of here. And you can go bang, 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 and repeat the pattern. That, to me, makes it really cool. You don't run out of water to fish. In fact, you can almost never get through all the water that there is to fish. So I'm going to go to the next slide here and um, talk about each lake. I kind of hinted at this, that each lake has its own, uh, there, there's so many different lakes, but each lake really has its own personality. Now there's a ton of them that I still haven't fished, but I've got to fish a number of the, the bigger fisheries, and though many of them are the s similar, or the same, they're, they're different. They each have something a little, a little bit different. Lake of the Woods, for example, I've talked about this before. Lake of the Woods is many fisheries onto itself. I mean, you could talk about the central basin of the lake is far different than the north basin, you know, in Clearwater Bay, Ptarmigan Bay, uh, and, and Whitefish Bay. You know, you've got clear trout water, and then you get into the center part where it's more of this meso walleye water. It's, it's very different. Now, you, you scoot down the road, you had the eagle, very similar thing. E Eagle's almost 80 miles long. You've got the western arm, gin clear lake trout water. The center section of the lake is this walleye factory, meso water, where basins are anywhere from 40 to 60 feet deep. Then you get into the southeast portion of it, and you're uh, often hard time to find 20 feet of water. It's all 8 to 12 feet dark brown water, which makes it a fish factory. It produces a ton of fish that move throughout the system, but that lake is very different depending on where you're at. You go just across the street from Eagle Lake, and all of a sudden you're in Wabagoon into Norwick, where in the summertime, up in visibility is only this deep. It's just crazy. So it's, you've got this really different water color just between the two. Wabagoon is pretty much, from every time I've been there, it's strictly a weed fishery. I, you know, with the, I've never been there late in the fall, but any time I've been there in the summer, it's ultra shallow slop weed fishing. That's just where the fish seem to be. Where, so if you're there in August, you're fishing shallow, sloppy weeds. Where if you're on Eagle Lake, for example, shallow, sloppy weeds in mid-August is not necessarily really a thing. You're looking more for main lake rock reefs. So you can see how that's different. And then you get to Lac Sewell. Lac Sewell is really a sand pit. There's just sand everywhere. And it's got that darker water color. Some places get, get really dark water. You've got a lot of cool current areas. You're doing a ton of weed fishing up there. There is still a lot of rock fishing, but it, the, the bottom makeup is different. The, the lakes just fish ever so slightly different. Some places the fish tend to be really shallow. Other places they'll, they'll roam open, you know, more open water. Then you've got other really cool small fisheries up there like the Indian Chain, Canyon, lakes that have a ton of, of muskies in them, really great action. And the Indian Chain, for example, is one of those same dynamic fisheries where when you head into Boulder, it's really, gin clear water and you're on the main part of the of the lake there it's a lot darker brown water the the Winnipeg River Manaki another just crazy crazy cool fishery and then there's a, a couple more up the 105 Cedar and Peralt two amazing fisheries that are just really classic musky water and I'm just I'm just scratching the surface there's so much up here to explore uh, you can spend a lifetime up here and you really do feel like an explorer and I, I just I think it's really cool so if you've been in a rut of going to a place, you're familiar with it, great, keep going there, but don't be afra afraid to venture out and look at some of these other fisheries. Most of them have giant fish, and they're all a little bit unique, and you can take something from each one of those fisheries and apply it to, to a new place. So, for example, if you're, you're fishing Wabagoon in dirty, shallow water, that might be something that you really haven't, it's not your forte, and you can apply that to Eagle if you happen to go there in late June, early July, because that's a great bite there. You get good at it in certain places, and you can carry those things, carry those things over. So they're, they're all unique, and it's, it's, it's really fun to, to explore out there. So moving on to the next slide. I want to talk about knowing water and learning new water. So um, 
I feel that there's an advantage to both. Basically, when you, you know water, I would say chances are if, if uh, somebody knows a body of water very intimately, they're going to be successful more times than somebody that doesn't know anything about it. However, sometimes it can be a negative. I'll share a story with you that didn't happen this last summer because we couldn't go, but the summer before, a, a friend of mine, Ben Beatty, is a, a guide on Lac Sewell, phenomenal muskie fisherman. 99 times out of 100, Ben would totally kick my butt fishing on Lac Sewell. The guy knows the water extremely well. He's an unbelievable muskie angler, but we were up there at, at, at the same time that Ben was guiding for a set number of days. And at the end of those few days, we ended up catching more fish than Ben did. Now, it, it wasn't because we were better anglers, but what the point of that was is that Ben had paying customers, and Ben knew that spot A, B, C, and D were fish producers at this time frame. These were his best spots, and so what did he do when he had paying customers on the line? He went to A, B, C, and D, A, B, C, and D. Maybe mixed a new spot in here and there, but he was fishing where he was confident, where he caught fish in the past, and we were going up there fishing a new section of the lake that we hadn't been to before, and we were just detectives. We were going, okay, we don't really know that water that well. We'd gotten some information from Ben and from some other people on areas that were, were known musky spots. We just started following the food. We were there in mid-September, it was right about the turnover, which everybody knows can be a really challenging time of year to fish, but we didn't look at, we didn't get married to spots because we didn't know spots. We didn't have history on spots. We didn't know if this was a spot that had produced 10, 50 inch muskies in the last two years. Ben had that experience. We didn't, we, we didn't have any of that attachment. So what was really interesting about this is we parked the houseboat kind of in the center east side of the lake. When we got up the first morning to fish, we, were, we wanted walleye teeth that night, so we were kind of putzing around looking at some of the water. It was like, wow, there was so much food where we were at. It was unbelievable. The Cisco's were just loaded there. There was 20-foot humps that were just covered up in walleyes, big pike. There's this fish all over in this particular area. We started muskie fishing there. We ended up catching a few muskies and some big pike, and it was like dynamite. We caught the muskies and pike and whatever weeds were left in the shallow weeds, and we're like, oh, man, this should be a great week. We've really got these things figured out. There was food nearby. Now the food wasn't in these six, seven foot weed beds, eight foot weed beds. The food was out in 20, 30 feet of water, but it still wasn't far for the fish to get access to that food, the Cisco's. So the, the food was there. Now we wake up the next morning, we go out to get walleyes that we're going to have for dinner that night or for lunch, and those same humps that we were looking at earlier, they were gone. Our, our depth finders were just blank. There was nothing. There was no food in this whole area that we'd fish. So we start fishing these areas. We saw fish the day before. We had action. It was dead. There was absolutely nothing happening. So we start moving down the lake. All of a sudden, we go over a hump. Boof, it's lit up. Big hooks. There's schools of bait everywhere. There's just signs of life everywhere. We start fishing weed beds, rock points adjacent to where this food is. What do you know? Big pike and muskies showed up. And over the course of the few days that we were there, these fish had moved about 12 miles. The school of bait was moving down the system. And so basically every day, our best indicator to find out where the good muskie pike fishing was, was to see, was to walleye fish and find out where we were seeing the food, where we were seeing the bait. And wouldn't you know it, the shallow, the shallow cover, rocks and weeds, primarily weeds, is where we ended up finding the muskies. So Ben, just ended up fit going through his milk run of fish, and he did run into a, a couple fish, but where he found the fish happened to be where the food was at the time as well. So we just were following the food, using our electronics, making observations about what was happening, and voila, we ended up scratching out what were really tough conditions, putting some fish in the boat. So in that case, not knowing anything about the water made us better because we were just simply reacting to the conditions to the environment that we were faced with, and uh, we ended up having success with it. Now, uh, you know, by contrast, if we were dealing with stable, perfect conditions, not mid-September, you're talking, you know, late July, early August, classic shallow rocks, shallow weed beds. If we were there at that time of year, you know, the moon was right, the weather was right, everything was going on. Ben could have gone to those same spots and totally destroyed us. We wouldn't have known where the spot on the spot was. 
A lot of these areas, it takes time. You need to go over it two, three times to really understand the intricacies of a spot. And so Ben knew that. So he would have kicked our butt if conditions were stable and the fish were where they were supposed to be under conditions when fish weren't really transitioning or moving. So my, my whole point of this is don't be intimidated to go to new water because often when you don't have preconceived notions, you can go into, into these fisheries and do relatively, relatively well. So that's, that's, that, I guess that's my point is don't be afraid to explore new water. Just because you, you're not familiar with it doesn't mean you can't be successful with it. Just pay attention to, what, to what's happening in the environment and chances are you're going to end up running into some muskies. So let's move on. And I, I was talking about this, fish move. So um, when I was making that example of following the, uh, following the bait, it's pretty remarkable about how certain areas of lakes can fire up depending on what, what's happening at any given point in time. So it seems as though if conditions are stable, water temps are rising or they're or relatively the same, fish tend to be homebodies from my experience. Every, there's no chaos, there's no big change up in the system. You can pretty much count on that if there's a bunch of fish in this area, they'll probably be in that area for a good portion of time. You get a big weather shift, you get a big wind shift, you have something like that. That can change what's happening. The other thing that can change is cover conditions. So when I talk about cover versus structure, I just want to make that clear what I'm talking about. So a structure to me would be like the framing of a house. A structure would be a point. A structure would be a hump. A structure would be a bay. Cover would be what's on that point or that hump. The cover could be wood, it could be rock, it could be weeds. So cover can often change, particularly weeds obviously can change. So early in the year as, as weeds are developing, when you get nice vertical standing green cover, boom, all of a sudden, late July, the weeds start growing, the water warms up. That can suddenly become a spot that wasn't a spot just a few days ago. Conversely, in the fall, as weeds start to die, they, they can change. So just always know that, that, that fish can be on the move. And that's one of the challenges that we face as muskie fisher, fishermen a lot, is you're wondering, okay, so are the fish not here or are the fish not biting? So if you're fishing areas, and muskies by nature are quite curious, if you're fishing areas that look good, but you're just not running into a lot of fish, you, you, they're, they're curious. So if, if you're around muskies, you should see them. If you're putting enough effort into it prime time, chances are they're probably not there, and you should look elsewhere. But if you're seeing fish, don't be afraid to fish those spots frequently. I often say fish good spots often. Now don't burn them out, fish them at prime times, but if it's a good spot, you're better off oftentimes to fish that good spot multiple times a day when you feel like the conditions are good, if there's a lot of fish there, than you are to just fish some willy-nilly stuff in between. All right, I'm gonna move on. So as I was talking about, this, this ties into a fish move. I mean, we, we all know that, but fish can move in, in different basins too. That's one of the, the big observations I've had fishing in Ontario, and this is not only for muskies, it's for pike, it's for lake trout, it's for walleye, is that certain depths of water can hold fish. So I'll give you an example. This is a, uh, the map we're looking at here is Eagle Lake. And we're looking at basically the center part of Eagle Lake here. And on, on the top of, of the map here, you can see that the darker colored water, that's a lot of 60 to 80 foot water. This part of the lake is absolutely loaded with all kinds of life in the summer. There's whitefish here, there's ciscos here, there's tons and tons of walleye, there's big pike, and this is primo musky habitat in midsummer. Now as you head towards the, the east and the southern portion of the lake where you see there's a little more green in the map and you're seeing a lot more red in the bays, that portion of the lake is relatively shallow. This section is absolutely killer on opener through early mid-July. This is where a lot of the fish are. As you travel further south, the water gets even shallower, and that's a big area of production for Eagle Lake. That's where a lot of the walleye spawn, a lot of musky spawning habitat, pike spawning habitat. A lot of the fish are hatched there, and as they get older, as the water warms up, as the food shifts, it'll start to make its way into the, the deeper basins of the, of the lake. So know that um, if you're fishing an area, that say, pay attention to how deep it is in that particular zone because it, I've seen it so many times where we're fishing an area of the lake and the, the depth is 
60 feet. We're just not seeing a lot there. There's just, ah, there's really no, we're not seeing that much for walleyes as we're going over some deeper humps. You know, maybe a couple pike in the weeds or shallow rocks, but we're not seeing much for muskies. Okay, well maybe it's, you know, instead of fishing all this water that's 60 feet around it, let's go look at something that's 40 feet. Let's check out what, what this, this basin here that's 30 to 40 feet deep looks like. All of a sudden you might start seeing all kinds of hooks and stuff as you're going over a point. It's loaded with walleyes. Fish can be, just be using certain basins and that's often related to the cold water forage, ciscos primarily, and, and whitefish. So depending on the habitat or where the food is for a, a lot of those bait fish will indicate where a lot of the big predators will be. So this is, a, and this is kind of big picture thinking, but I'm always thinking about what are the basin depths nearby in that area and what kind of life am I seeing in those areas. So a big muskie might not be living out in open water with ciscos all the time, but you can be sure that it wants to be near ciscos. So it can be running out from a weed bed, hunting ciscos, coming back into the shallows and resting, right? So if, if there's not ciscos or there's not food nearby, they don't have to be within eyesight of it, they can know, they just have a sense to know where it is, but they still want to be within a close traveling distance of where that food is to get access to it. So really pay attention to those, uh, those basin areas. And sometimes it's, it's, the, it's the really deep clear stuff. For example, if you've got a major cold front in late July or something like that, early August, you might be better off if it's gray, gray days, heavy storms, heavy winds, you might be way better off to go look in that trout water, that gin clear, super deep water where you've got great conditions. Just it, 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 that, that, that big volume of water and that trout water isn't as susceptible to temperature drops, like as opposed to fishing shallow weedy bays where you might lose one, two, three, four, five degrees of water overnight. Those areas can just shut right off. Not that the fish necessarily vacate that whole area, they might just be neutral or negative, where if you went and looked at another basin that had more volume of water that held its heat longer, you might find that those areas are, are more productive. So I hope that makes sense. Just when you're looking at the shield water, also break it down into little mini lakes. You don't have to trailer your boat in Canada to go to a new lake. You can just say, okay, this section of the lake has this type of water. This section has this type of water. These two are different. This one's not working. Let's go try this one. All right, current. Current's another big thing to fish, whether you're, um, that, that, that was a slide change, by the way. So current, current's another big deal to, uh, to fish up in Canada. R really, in, I, don't, I don't care where you're fishing muskies, current's a big deal. Now current, most of these big bodies of water on the shield are reservoirs. So there's, it's con you know, the water flow is controlled. Eagle, Lake of the Woods, Lac Sewell, Wabagunda Norwick, those are all, they're all big reservoirs, right? The Manaki, the Winnipeg River, all, all, have, uh, all have dams on them and the, and the, the water's controlled. So um, there can be current generated by obviously pulling water, not that it's necessarily that noticeable, but more often than not, it's, it's generated by wind. And so what wind can do in, the, in those situations is wind can, of course, push water through certain areas Creating, creating current, you'll be able to see seams, you'll be able to see what's happening, but it can also change the water temperature, believe it or not. So an example was, this was two years ago when I was on Eagle, I, I was up there in um, late June, early July, something like that. We'd had a really hot bite going in shallow weedy bays and it had been really hot. It had been in the 80s for the time we were up there. It was the first big warm front and it was, it was just fantastic fishing. I think um, that morning I caught a great big one and we saw a few other ones in this weedy bay on this particular side of the, the west side of the lake and the water was like 72 degrees, something like that. So we, we came in, I went to get my wife, we were gonna go back out that afternoon and the wind came up. It was howling like 40, 50 miles an hour. There was no storm, but it was just a huge wind event. The wind was just howling and we went back there that evening after about 10 hours of a really strong blow in the water temp that was 72 in that spot in the morning was 62. It had dropped 10 degrees. It had pushed all that warm water across and sucked the cold water in. So the wind actually made the temperature fall. I don't know that the fish vacated that area, but the fishing was horrible. Just abandoned it altogether because we had a 10 degree temperature drop on an 85 degree hot day. So know that wind is not only making current, it's gonna make current when it's blowing, it's also gonna make current 
when it's coming back, when everything e equalizes. So it's going to, as, as wind blows, it's going to stack up the warm water on, the, on the, the windward side of the lake. The warmer water is going to push the colder water down so that warmer water is going to sink deeper into the water column. And on the other side of the lake, picture this, you're going to have the colder water rising up and there's going to be less of the warm water on this particular side of the lake. Now as that balances out, you're going to have a current shift back and forth. So know that water temperature can, um, can be greatly influenced by current, but pay attention to those, those current areas if, <clears throat> is what I'm getting at. So pay attention to what the temp temperature is, but also pay attention to current areas because these can be probably the most consistent spots to catch fish. If there's narrows in a lake where the water is always moving through there, it's consistently moving, those are spots when you're really struggling, you're having a tough trip, you just can't seem to put anything together. Moving water seems to be an area that you can almost always run into fish. I don't care what time of year it is. It seems like if you're up there in June on the opener or you're there in uh, early November just before freeze up, current areas can be really those spots you can fall back on when it seems like everything else is, is just falling apart. So know that those are, those are sweet spots that, that areas that always have current, but pay attention to neck downs in between islands or, or areas where the lake's cut off. There's a big pinch point in the lake and pay attention to the prevailing winds because you, the day you show up on a trip, it might've been flat calm for three days and some neck down in the lake might look like nothing. There's absolutely no life there. Suddenly you get a big wind event. That might be good for two, three, four days. If the wind is consistent, it keeps blowing, it's great, but don't just think because the wind stopped blowing, it's not a good spot. Once that wind stops blowing, that water is going to move back the other way. So you can have, you can have really good fishing in, in areas that, uh, with wind-generated current before, during and following those wind events. So wind events up there are really, really big deals, and um, I, I, I absolutely recommend focusing on that. Now, don't just think about uh, windy spots either. Don't just think that you've got to fish the, the windward side of this. If it's... If it's the wind's blowing in there, that's got to be where the active fish are. Oftentimes, that's just not the case. You get a really nasty, cold, windy day in August, and maybe it's one of those days where you've got those big puff, puffy clouds, the sun's out, and on the back side of it, it's just a slick, sunny sand spot. You're fishing the wind, the rocks, you're pound, chucking at that, you're just not seeing anything. Don't be afraid to slip into those lee sides where it's nice and calm. It's probably comfortable for the muskies in there. It's comfortable for you. Just, just always experiment. See what's, go, see what's going on. Don't always think that you have to be in the wind or in the guts of the current. Look for slack water. Look for those, those, those other areas where fish might want to get a little more comfortable too. So anyway, that's my rant on, on current. I'm going to move on to the, uh, the next slide here. So weeds. This sounds really um, probably kind of dumb, but... It's true, like weeds are good for fishing. And um, I, I spent a lot of time in Canada fishing early when I was a teenager going up there. I was just, that's uh, the only thing we had confidence in was fishing weed beds. Didn't know about rock fishing at the time or knew that it was a thing, but we weren't really good at it. So we spent a lot of time in weeds. Then I learned about, you know, fishing reefs, fishing, you know, offshore rocks, looking for big fish out there. And of course, that's a, that's a great pattern, but I've kind of come full circle, and I, I really, really, really love fishing weed beds up there. And weeds hold fish up there all season long, but it depends on the kind of weeds that you're fishing. So I can, you know, cabbage, I'll, I'll go through a slide here, um, uh, just down the way here, but cabbage is one of the, the best plants you can find up, up there. It's a big, green, leafy plant. Some of it's tobacco, but most, most cabbage is a, is a big, green, leafy plant that you see up there. There's coontail up there. That's another great plant that you, that you run into. Deer tongue's another, another good plant, but cabbage beds are you know, kind of the thing that everybody's looking for. And from opener through, I've, I've caught fish in there in November. Those weed beds can be good all the way late in the year as long as the cover remains vertical. So you hear a lot of people talking about green weeds. I'm referring to later in the year. Yes, green weeds, are, that, that's the best if you can find green weeds, but vertical standing cover seems to be a, a, a trumping element. So it's not, most of these lakes, you, you don't have, you know, all oh, green weeds produce oxygen, blah, blah, blah. These lakes aren't in an oxygen, they're, they're not in, they're, there's plenty of oxygen for fish to survive in these fisheries, right? So oxygen isn't the factor. It's like, is, is there life there? So the weed beds might be dying, but there could still be tons of invertebrate life living in that weed bed. 
tons of bait. There could be, you know, there can be shiners in there. There can be perch. There could be ciscos and whitefish. We'll even, I've caught whitefish through the ice um, in January and February up in Ontario in water that's this deep in the back end of, back end of muddy bays where there's crummy vertical standing cover. It's vertical standing cover. It's good ambush cover. And if that cover is still remaining vertical, it can be a great spot to fish throughout, throughout the year. Now, when I go up, my first trip I, I do for muskies is usually like the week after opener. And uh, that's all I do. I just, I hunt weeds. I just, I love weed fishing up there. And I'll kind of explain to you in this next slide here um, how I go about finding weed beds. So I just changed slides. I'm going to talk about where to find weeds in, in Canada. So the, the easiest thing to do to find weed beds up here is to use your eyes and look for sand. If you see sandy bays on most of the fisheries up there, Lake of the Woods is a little different now with the rusty crayfish, but a lot of the other fisheries, if there's sand on the beach, chances are there are weeds out in front of it. Now the cabbage you see here in the slide with, with the muskie next to it, that's, the, that's cabbage that I'm talking about. That, um, that stuff often grows in like eight to 10 feet. So I've made the mistake plenty. I've seen other people do it where you see a sandy beach and you go start running around looking in four, five, six feet of water looking for weeds and you're just not seeing much. You're actually, you're looking for them on the inside if you're going looking for them with your eyes. So know that these, these weed beds usually start at, you know, about eight feet is a good, good depth for these things to be in. Six maybe, out to 10, 12, but that eight, 10 foot is where a lot of those plants live. And the first place I look is, uh, is, is areas that have sand. So it could be a, you could look at a big beach. If you find a big beach on an area, chances are out in front of that beach in eight to 10 feet of water, there's gonna be a weed bed somewhere out in front of there. Little cup bays, little cup bays are also classic spots where you can find cabbage if there's sand in the background. There doesn't always have to be sand to have weeds, but those are some really, really good starting points. And then of course they just, they'll grow in, in random locations as well. But you can see on this map here, this is another map of, of Eagle Lake, a lot of what I'm looking for, you can see that I have the, uh, uh, this is a feature on the hummingbirds called shallow water highlight and depth highlight. So the shallow water highlight is water that's less than eight feet deep. And the green stuff is that stuff that's between like nine and 12 feet deep. So anywhere I've got that green meeting the red or I see a big area with red, chances are those red areas are gonna be areas that are gonna be nearby weeds. So I can start to look at bays and go, okay, this bay, it only gets to be 10, 12 feet way out in front here. There's a lot of red in the back of it. Chances are that's gonna be a good spot. So just big picture, I turn on my hummingbird, I set my depth highlight to specifically target that depth range. I can instantly figure out where a lot of the, the weed beds will likely be. All right, so I'm gonna move on to other ways to, to find them. Changing slides here. And also guys, I have to apologize as I, as I talk about finding these weeds. I'm standing in our studio, we film Angling Buzz here, and I've got all these lights on and it just went from uh, about, I don't know, it's probably 65 degrees in here and I think the temperature now with all these giant lights burning is about 90, so I apologize for the sweating. All right, but anyway, let's, let's talk about weeds here. So a few ways to find them. I just talked about using the depth highlight and the shallow water highlight feature on the hummingbird. The other thing is side imaging. This is another great tool. So when I'm, when I'm going to these places looking for weeds, when I go to a new spot in Canada, whether it's Jimmy and I or anybody from the office, we're going up there, we spend a ton of time driving. The last time I was on Eagle with my wife, we were up there for the week. We were up there for, we got four days to fish, and I put over 25 hours on my boat just driving. That's just driving. 25 hours in that four-day period. I wasn't fishing. I was just driving. And I know the lake. I've fished it a lot, but weed beds can change from year to year. And I don't want to just go to spots. I'm like, oh, this is a good spot because a spot I might have had fantastic fishing in last year might not have weeds in it this year. So every time I get to these fisheries, I want to do an inventory of what the best weed beds look like. So I get on the motor and I'm usually running these spots that I think will have weeds anywhere between about four and 10 miles an hour. If I can run at four miles an hour with side imaging, I can get a really good picture. So now this image you're seeing on the, on the, on the right of this slide here, this is a, a picture, it's a screen capture 
of what the plant looks like on the left. So that's the cabbage I'm talking about on the left. So that's an underwater picture of the plant, and on the right, you can, you can see the weed. So without me being able to point directly to it, if you look on the right, you'll see these little white dots. If you're familiar with side imaging, you might almost think they're fish. It looks like kind of grains of rice on the right center. It's between the 48 and 66 foot mark, about a third of the way down the screen from the top. You see that little cluster of white? Each one of those white dots are cabbage plants. That's the sonar return that you get with side imaging from a cabbage bed. And you can see there's a few more scattered about in there. So if the plants aren't tall enough yet or the water's too dirty that I can't see them with my eyes, I can go through at about four miles an hour with my side imaging and I can look and say, oh, boom, look at that. It looks like, it actually looks like there's a school of panfish or school of walleyes there, but indeed, that's the signature that you get from side imaging with cabbage plants. So I'd recommend, if you're, you're fortunate enough to have side imaging technology in your boat, if you find a weed bed, drive through that weed bed at a speed that you'd, you'd want to be cruising and looking for and see what those weeds look like so you can get a visual picture of what they are. And now you can just start hunting. You just boom, 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 hunt. So I'll start the day out on the best spot. I'll be out there before dawn, right at dawn. I'm going to fish till if conditions are, if it's a poor day, I might only fish till 9 or 10 in the, in the morning, and then I'm going to start looking, and I'll wait till some, the weather changes. And I don't mind spending from 9 till noon just driving and looking, not casting, and then maybe have lunch, come back out after lunch, just start driving, looking, driving, looking. And then when it gets to be that prime time, or I've got the day on my trip when the weather's right, it's like, I know that boom, 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 boom. I've got what I think are absolutely the best spots, spots where I saw the best cover. A lot of times, believe it or not, when you're driving around looking for this cover, I'll see muskies suspended in the weed bed. So I've made visual contact with a number of fish and sometimes really big fish in these weed beds as I'm looking. So I can go like, oh man, I saw a 48 and a 52 and a 44 in this little bay as I was going through it at four miles an hour. They were three feet under the surface on a flat, calm, sunny day. They probably wouldn't have bit anyway, but I know they're there, I know the cover was good, and I can come back and repeat it. So make sure you've got good polarized glasses when you're looking at these spots, but really spend a lot of time on weeds, man. I'm telling you, if they're, if they're good weed beds, they will hold fish throughout the course of the year and they can just be fish magnets. So I'm gonna talk about one more, one more thing about, about, about weeds too before I, I, I change slides. So. Um, Depending on when you're there, so the, the weed beds will generally be good starting in mid-June all the way through kind of the end of August, depending on where you're at. The first few cold fronts, those plants can be really susceptible to water temperature changes and they can start to brown and fall. But like I was mentioning before, coontail is another weed that I didn't mention here, but coontail tends to be hardier in cooler water and maintain that vertical structure. So don't be afraid then to look for coontail and deer tongue which is kind of a, it's almost like people call them dollar pads. It's just a, it's almost like a little mini lily pad that's oblong, shaped like that. Those plants are really common up there too. They tend to grow in about six feet of water. I've got big muskies and big pike out of those weed beds into October. So just don't be afraid that, oh man, you know, it's, it's late September, it's October, it's early November, you're fishing rocks, you're fishing what would be considered a classic fall stuff. Things might not be happening. Don't be afraid to go check out those weed beds, man. Look at how many pi people go pike fishing in weed beds and end up incidentally catching musky ice fishing when they're putting tip-ups in weed beds in early ice. So just because it's late fall, it doesn't mean that all the fish just left. They went looking for ciscos and rock piles. Muskies love weeds. They love vertical standing cover and they will use it any chance they get. All right, that's my rant on weeds. So we'll just talk briefly about presentations here because I think I'm, uh, getting close to the end of my, my time, but um, presentation is, is such a personal, personal thing. Um, when it comes to presentation, of course, it, it's, uh, you know, what's, what's, the best, what's the best lure to fish with in Canada? Or what's, you know, what's your favorite lure? Well, there's a number of things that come into play. Number one is efficiency. How efficient can you cover water? How good is that bait at getting bites, hooking and holding fish, and triggering strikes, right? So there's a lot of, lot that goes into choosing your presentation. Now, uh, really what it comes down to that's in my boat up there in Canada, I'm going to have topwaters, I'm going to have bucktails, inline spinners, 
I'm going to have safety pin style spinners for fishing heavy weeds like slop like I'm talking about and I'll have, uh, I'll have glide baits and I'll have uh, dive and rise baits which I don't have on this particular list but um, bucktail is going to be your number one bait day in and day out through the warm water period. Muskies will still bite bucktails even in the very very cold temperatures. I'm talking late fall. Fish will still be susceptible to spinners but you know for me when I get up there early in the season um, in, in July, for, for the most part, I've got on a single eight or double eight Colorado, little, little tiny bucktail, something like that. I'm going to cast and wind. I'm just going to make a ton of cast, 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 cast. I want to hit all these pockets. So I've been talking a lot about weed bed fishing, but if I'm going through one of those weed beds, I'm going to fish it slow. I'm not going to go in there with a bucktail and be like, oh yeah, sweet, I can cover water fast. I can make one cast here, make another cast 30 feet over that way make another cast 30 feet over that way, be done. I'm going to go boom. I'm going to make short, deliberate casts, not necessarily long bomb casts. And if I'm going through a big giant weed bay, I'm just making shorter casts and I'm making lots of them. So that's, that's one of the things I see with, with efficiency that you can, even though it's a bucktail, you can go wrong with. It happens all the time. You get somebody in the boat, you're in this big expanse of weed bed. You're like, oh my gosh, it's beautiful. There's a target there. There's a nice hole in the weeds there. There's another hole there. There's another hole. You can see all these great spots and the wind might be pushing you through the weed bed and somebody just makes a cast, psh, they throw it out as far as they can possibly throw it into this weed bed and they reel it back and it takes them a minute to get the bait back to the boat. Well at that same time I would have thrown five other casts being like there's a hole there, psh, boom, there's a hole there, reel it in, boom, there's a hole there, reel it in, boom, there's a spot there. So I'm just making really short casts. So that's what I mean by efficiency. I'm fishing uh, when I'm fishing with small bucktails, I fish with St. Croix Downsizer 9-foot rod with a 300 size Alexa reel, 65-pound braid, and it's just, it's like bass fishing. I can make really short casts, and you can totally kick butt on this presentation, especially early in the season when you're weed fishing. Make shorter casts, but more casts, and you're going to end up covering more water, and ultimately you'll put more fish in the boat. A lot of fish are not, when they're in that cover, I've seen it time and time again with largemouth bass, I've seen it with muskies, I've seen it with walleyes. When fish are in cover, they're not as afraid of your presence. You don't have to be as far away from them. Granted, it's nice to be further away from fish than you can be. But when they're in cover, you don't have to make a mile-long cast to get those fish to bite. You can make, you want to keep your distance, but you can make shorter casts and talk them into, talk them into biting <clears throat> within that short window. Now, um, the other bait that's obviously a great summertime tool is top water and, and top water is one of those lures you just can't ever rule out. Um, I don't care if it's um, I don't care if it's even late in the fall I've seen fish fish biting but but like the inline spinner it's primarily a warm water bait. For me I've got a, a prop bait you know something like a fat bastard or a smaller pacemaker those are two of my favorite prop baits. It's kind of it, it accompanies a bucktail real well you can throw those two baits together, you can cover a lot of water, they move relatively quickly together, um, but then if um, I've got a spot where I'm like, oh man, I know there's a big fish, there are, are other top waters that I, that I really like to have in the boat. One of them is a hog wobbler. I just love a hog wobbler. If I know where a big fish is sitting, I want to be there right at first light in the morning or I want to be there right at last light or a nice calm night. Hog wobbler is one of those dynamite baits. Another one of the baits that I, I think gets, that gets overlooked, it seems like everybody today is throwing prop baits and that is the top water arsenal period. But hog wobblers, creepers are still a couple, you know, kind of those creepy crawly baits. Flap tails is, a, is another bait that I've had a lot of action with in the last few years. And then um, jump baits. What I mean by that is a walk the dog style. Bloop, 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 bloop. That is a really excellent bait for getting fish to show themselves. Um, a little example of this, a couple years ago I was on a, I was on a weed bed in Ontario and uh, I'd been in there the night before and it had um, a really big fish come up on a flap tail, giant 40 pounder comes up on a flap tail. And I see another one about a 48 incher comes up on a flap tail, they're pushing water not biting. I see another one comes up on a, another like, you know, really big 52 plus incher comes up on this on this flap tail. So now I've seen three fish that are like 30 to 40 plus pounds in this small area. I come back in the morning, I throw a, a hog wobbler, nothing. Okay, I go through there with a the bucktail, nothing. I'm just like, man, I just can't believe these fish aren't there. 
I put on a walk the dog style bait, boom, instantly I get one of the fish to go. So sometimes that doop, 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 it's not in line, it's not consistent, it's something that's more erratic, it's, it's doing something that, that, whether it's a glide bait or if it's a jump bait, top water, that walk the dog action is often a tattle bait. So if you're convinced there's fish there, you know they're there, you're willing to slow down to try to, to get them to show themselves or bite, those jump baits can be, can be really good. So I'm gonna just kind of lump jump baits in with glide baits when I'm talking about that side to side. And then safety pin spinner baits. It's a bait that's overlooked by a lot of people. You just don't see people throwing them much. Now they can be really, really effective tools in weeds, but they can also be incredibly effective in open water. One of the biggest Canadian muskies I, I caught, I caught on a rock point. I was throwing a, a just double Colorado spinner, an ounce and a quarter spinner with a little boot tail on the back. Threw it out, counted it down to three, four, five, something like that. Start slow rolling it along that edge, just like you would a crankbait. It's a spinner working down eight, ten feet in the water and doof, get, get smoked. So spinner baits, people think primarily they're, they're cover baits, but they're not. They can work exceptionally well. Fish don't see spinner baits all that often in open water. Now, when it comes to fishing them in cover, one of the, the keys to fishing them, and whether it's cover or open water, is letting them get down. So, Fish see lures all the time, muskies do, that are this far from the surface of the water. That's one of the things as muskie anglers we're always doing is we're fishing really close to the surface. It's not that often that we're getting deeper into the, into the water column. So a safety pin spinner is one that you can chunk into a weed bed, count it down until basically it hits the bottom of the weed bed. And to avoid getting hung up with it, you want to point the rod at the lure. So you point it at it and, and you reel. And when you get caught up on a piece of cover, you're just going to shake it in line. You don't want to lift or pull the bait to the side because that turns the bait and it gets snagged in the cover. You want to keep pointing right at it. Shake, 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 shake. When you get hung up, that's a good thing. You want to make contact with that cover. Start shaking the plant. Fish know something's going on. If it doesn't just fall right out, snap it down and in line. The bait's going to burst forward and slow it down, kill it. And often that's when you get your strike. So, Consider spinner baits too, they're a dynamite tool, they, they work in a, in a wide uh, depth range throughout the water column, so spinner baits are an overlooked tool. And uh, I'm gonna move on to the next one because I know that I'm getting close on time. So, dive and rise. This is a super shad that, that's on this particular picture, one of my favorite all-time baits. If you're going to Canada, you haven't been there before, this is a lure that you'll absolutely want to have. I've caught huge smallmouth on it, I catch lake trout on it, catch big walleyes on it, catch northern pike on it, and I catch a bunch of muskies on it. Everything bites it. It's the profile of a beautiful sized Cisco. Every fish bites this. Now, I, I'm using this uh, super shad as a dive and rise example. This bait can be trolled. It can be fished like a crankbait or a jerkbait, but the point is it's buoyant. A super shad and a 10 inch floating suic, the original wood suic, are two of my go-to baits up there. There's something about a, a wood very buoyant bait that just goes down, comes up, goes down, comes up. Can be just like a glide bait can, it can be absolutely deadly. I'm talking deadly for catching fish in this part of the world. So believe it or not, when I was, I'm gonna go back to talking about weed beds again. You can fish a treble hook bait like a super shad or a 10 inch suic in some of the thickest stuff that you can imagine. Often stuff that you look at, you're saying, there's no way you could get any lure with the treble hook through there. But you can fish very buoyant wood baits in there. The super shad and the 10 inch suic back themselves up. So what you do is you'll, you'll pull the bait down, the bait will, will dive into the water, it's gonna make contact with the cover and they float up backwards. So you pull, release, pull, release. And that bait will just make its, make its way hunting through there. And if you, you give the bait slack and it doesn't release forward, just a quick Quick snap, a little slack in your line, you slap the rod tip down, it'll burst it through the cover, it'll hunt one more time, and it'll come back up. And it's really rare, believe it or not, even in some of the thickest cover, not that you want to throw it into the thick cover, you want to pick lanes, but in the really, really thick stuff, it's amazing how few times you actually come back with weeds on the end of your line. So you can present these crankbaits in those situations. And Suix, I'm telling you, if, if, like if, I, if I'm going to Canada, and this is just me, right? There's a lot of people that are more successful than me at this, but my confidence baits are I'm gonna have a bucktail and my probably my number two or maybe my number one in a lot of situations up there will be a 10 inch floating suic. Like if you just gave me that bait 
to go up there and fish. I would have a lot of fun. I would catch a lot of fish and you catch fish year round. Something about the, I'm not talking about a weighted sook. I'm talking about one that's got a lot of buoyancy that can dive and hunt. And you can get that bait to fish deep too. It's all depending on how you work it. If you're just, if you're doing light pulls and pauses and giving a lot of slack, you can keep it really near the surface. But if you start snapping it and not giving it much slack, using your reel, you can keep diving that bait deeper and deeper into the water column and get the bait to hunt. So they're both really versatile. Like I said, the Super Shad is one that it's a great pike bait, it's a walleye bait, it's a smallmouth bait. The 10-inch the sook tends to be more of a musky pike only, but that Super Shad can be, can be one that if you're, you just want to go get a ton of action, go throw that thing around weed beds, rock piles, fish it like a jerk bait, you'll be floored at how many fish you'll catch with it. Now, I'm going to change uh, Slides again here, I'm going to talk about another bait. Um, get away from weed fishing, I'm going to talk about rod, rock fishing that I am totally floored with. And we actually just shot a show um, this fall using the uh, X-Rap Deep 30s. It's called, the uh, it, it's a suspending jerk bait. So this one happens to be a triple D, I really like that one. I also really like the X-Rap 30s and the X-Rap 40s. Suspending jerk baits, if you, uh, if you ever fished smallmouth bass, if you ever fished walleyes or largemouth, in cold water, a suspending jerkbait can lights out be the best thing going. You can throw every lure in your tackle box and get skunked or maybe get a fish or two and put on a suspending jerkbait and totally clean house, catch more fish than you've ever seen it. A suspending jerkbait when it's on can be one of the most mind-blowing things in fishing. And I don't see a lot of musky guys throwing suspending jerkbaits, but they are incredibly effective. A lot of people might look at that triple D and say, oh yeah, I really like that crankbait. Cast it out, reel it in, pull it. I'm not fishing the bait like that at all. I'm fishing it just like I would a jerkbait, an X-Rap. So this bait, I'll cast it out, reel it down a couple turns so I get the bill going in the water, and it's snap, snap, pause. Snap, snap, pause. Snap, 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 pause. Maybe crank it down a little bit. Snap, snap, pause. And a lot of times you're getting those strikes on the end, and you'll notice the bait that I have in this particular picture has a feather on the back. Like a number 10 X wrap for smallmouth in, in cold water when the water's in the 40s and the 50s, most of the smallmouth that you catch end up coming on that back feather hook. And the same thing is true with muskies. This show we shot this last fall, um, I think I got four muskies that day. All four of the muskies I caught that day were caught on the back hook. They came up and they kissed that bait. They kissed it right on the end, just like a smallmouth would. They're curious, they follow it, they're looking, they're kind of, you've seen them before where they're opening their mouths, you kill the bait, and instead of just smashing it, because the water's cold, you're letting the bait hang there, they'll come up and they'll just kiss that feather on the back and you go, ha, gotcha. It is absolutely incredibly effective and not a lot of people are doing this. This is more of a cold water presentation. So when a lot of the guys are throwing, um, big bulldogs or throwing medusas, that type of thing. I, I, that, that, I know that stuff is incredibly effective. It catches a ton of big fish. I really like, I just like fishing with the, I, I like jerkbait fishing and I do it a lot. This is my choice for October and November when I'm fishing baits like that. I've caught so many darn fish on this. It's absolutely incredible. The one in this photo I've caught that trip, I don't know how many fish, we caught so many fish over 30 pounds on that trip. And we're, we'd see them oftentimes too. You can see this is a side imaging picture, some of the fish, but sometimes you can actually see them and cast to them and you can talk the bait and in, 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 talk the fish into biting. So an advantage to the suspending jerk bait is just picture if you saw these fish on your side imaging and uh, they're down, they're a foot or so off, off the bottom and say 12 feet of water on a rock pile, you throw a bulldog out there, you count it down to 10, so it's just off the bottom. You know that the fish is interested in it. You pull it and the fish loses interest. As it's falling, the fish is getting curious, but you pull it, it's, it's starting to lose interest. With this, as soon as that fish gets engaged, you can just stop it. And the fish gets closer, you twitch it, the fish moves, it gets closer, and it can just sit in the fish's strike zone for, for an extended period of time. So having the ability of a lure to sit in place, sit in the strike zone for an extended period of time, particularly in cold water, is absolutely effective. So the other thing with it is too, when you're fishing shield water, you're fishing rocks, it's not snagging. If you've ever been with somebody who's not, or, or me myself, you're, you're going to a brand new reef in the middle of the, the ocean up there where you're like, wow, you know, how is this structure even laid out? 
You go start throwing big rubber around there, you try to count that thing down, boom. You're snagged in rocks, you're snagged in rocks. You're scared you're gonna trash your boat because you're fishing sinking baits. With this, the bait doesn't snag very often and I'll weight them just enough so they're ever so slightly buoyant so they're not bearing in and you can often just shake your, shake your rod on high, they'll start to float out and you're not getting snagged. So that's another big advantage of the suspending, suspending jerk bait. So with that, I'm going to end it. Um, I'll welcome any questions. Thank you for listening to uh, a lot of rambling. I hope that made sense. Please feel free to um, ask any questions that you've got. You can look for a lot of content that we produce here at Linder Media Productions on anglingedge.com. We've also got a YouTube channel. Check out Angling Buzz where we do a lot of timely content, uh, not only open water but also ice fishing. We do another show called Lund's Ultimate Fishing Experience where you can see a lot of great content from a number of uh, great Lund Pro staff across the country. And we do a series for Ontario called the Ontario Experience with uh, Troy Linder and Ty Shadeen where they go to some really cool places. So appreciate you guys watching and uh, check out some of the other content that we've got available online. Thank you.